Good day, this is Dr. T and welcome to my hotel room. Yes, I'm traveling and I am traveling to the 2022 Biennial Convention on Chemical Education or BCCE. Uh, this is, as the name would suggest, a convention held every two years on chemical education. If you are a chemistry educator, so high school, college, yeah, I mean, those would be kind of your main choices, but I guess anything else that I can't think of. Uh, this is the premier conference. Uh, this has a great atmosphere. Uh, I've been to it on several occasions. Obviously didn't go to the 2021 because it you know, didn't exist because, you know, 2020. Uh, but it has a great atmosphere. It's, it's everyone going around like, here's what I'm doing. Uh, here's what I've done research on. Here's ways you can improve your teaching. Here's ways you can do what I did kind of thing. So instead of the kind of normal conference, you know, you go to a national ACS meeting, it's like, here's what I did. Look at me. This one's much more of, here's what I did. You can do it too. Or here's some ideas. Um, so you've got some, you know, straight up uh, chemical education research, things that were probably published in JCAMAD or are going to be, as well as some more experiential uh, topics, uh, all of which are really exciting. And so I'm heading up to Purdue University uh, for this conference in West Lafayette, uh, Indiana. And this video is going to be kind of a vlog of the conference. Now, due to everyone else's copyrights, I can't, you know, start live streaming the uh, uh, presentations, etc. So I'm going to have to keep my camera more or less to myself. But I've got the GoPro and the sound recorder with me. So hopefully the audio is not garbage. And um, I'll be giving some reflections after uh, each of the sessions, workshops, etc. And yeah, once again, if you're a chemical educator, uh, when this comes up in 2024 again, I strongly encourage you. Uh, I don't know where it's at. I should go look that up. Uh, but yeah, great conference. So I will see you very shortly. Okay, so now I'm at uh, the campus of Purdue University. I uh, wanted to do a little bit of an update before I went to the first session, but that did not have time to do that. Hit the hotel and go to the first session. Okay, uh, so first session was on disruptive grading, basically specs grading, mastery grading, which um, I've been using those two interchangeably. It appears that there is a difference with those. Uh, so general idea, the specs grading seems to be smaller assignments. There's four speakers, two of which were using very small assignments, but maybe like 20 of them. And I do apologize for the wiggle on the camera. Um, so they were using, you know, 20 assignments or so, um, and the other two were only doing, you know, around 10-ish assignments, but they were much, much larger assignments done out of class, um, probably more of like report style, uh, case studies, that kind of thing. So definitely an interesting option. I hadn't thought of doing that. Uh, two of the, uh, two of the presenters did, um, all or nothing grading. Uh, one of each type of assignment, so one large case study, all or nothing grading, seems rough to me, but okay. Uh, and then one of the smaller sets, uh, and then with the ability to redo or recreate. Several of these would be more of what I would consider kind of the ungrading with the larger assignments, because the students could redo them. Uh, and then the other uh, two were doing a uh, type of grading I had never heard of, which was um, excellence, mastery, needs revisions, and then just not acceptable or not uh, accessible. So it's just not, not enough there to do anything with. Um, one didn't really say how that was translated into scoring. The other one, um, who actually didn't particularly care for it and was going to go to all or nothing grading, uh, but they were doing basically 100%, 80%, 50%, 0% for each one of those categories. Uh, so definitely an interesting category I hadn't thought of, uh, something I'm going to have to think about for future classes. All of the presenters appear to be keeping some aspects of the class, you know, the final exam uh, and other things kind of like normal, but we're doing... Um, basically the exam portion was being completely replaced by either a specs grading or a mastery grading based uh, structure. So uh, definitely an interesting one. Um, I couldn't plug in the computer, so it's gonna be interesting typing up notes uh, in the hotel tonight. But otherwise, um, see you in the next clip. Hey, okay, so just got done with the vendor sessions. Um, so looking at kind of the, you know, tons of textbook folks, uh, new lab things, uh, so kind of just what I thought was interesting, uh, right off the bat, last one I talked to was Vernier. Uh, they have two new probes. One's a GC um, that's like that big, <laughs> so tiny little GC, um, and it connects in with their uh, LabQuest, from what I can tell. 
A uh, second one uh, that I'm much more interested in is a cyclic voltammetry um, probe, <laughs> I guess would be the description. Uh, it's the Go Connect, so it sounds like it can connect with a lot of different things, presumably the LabQuest as well. has a disposable probe, but you know it's a relatively small device, so if we want to do some cyclic voltammetry, I don't see it in my classes, but um, I think I'll be talking to a couple of my colleagues about that. Okay, talked to Lab Archives. Sorry, the wind is catching up. Uh, they do a student lab book. One thing I've been struggling with is I've wanted to do an electronic lab book for my students. Tried doing an open source alternative. Uh, didn't really work. This one, the student buys it. You can do an institutional license or the student buys it. 20 bucks. Um, and then it's, you know, each student has their own lab book, but I can look at it completely digital. That is really tempting. Great for accessibility, which is why I've been wanting to do it. Not to mention, you know, let's get away from paper because the industry is doing a lot of electronic lab books. So really, really interesting. Uh, Top Hat's got a textbook. That's about all I'll say on that one. Uh, other one, Grade Scope. Turns out my university system um, already has a site license, so I can try this out. Uh, this is done by Turnitin, but a completely separate division. Uh, apparently this one, and I heard one of the speakers in the previous session I was at talk about this one. They loved it. Uh, but the idea here is that you can have a student, you know, write out a bunch of answers. You know, question one, question two, question three. It, they upload it to the LMS, and then it splits those questions apart so you can see all question ones, all question twos, all questions threes. And then you can go through and um, grade them. It has a built-in rubric and it allows you to do like retroactive rubric uh, amendments, which is something the LMS that I've used does not have. So if you say, okay, I'm gonna take off two points for this error. Oh wait, no, you know, I only wanna take off one point after you're halfway through the class. It will regrade everybody for you, or it's like, no, you know what? This, this needs more taken off. I'm gonna take off five points. It'll redo that. At least I assume it does the latter part. The example was the former, but you know. Uh, so yeah. Uh, definitely an interesting one. I wouldn't, if we didn't already have the site license, I wouldn't be interested, but we already have it. So yeah, tempting. Might use it. Okay. Uh, see you in the next clip. Okay. So was at the um, first part of a workshop on specs grading, kind of, you know, flushing it out more, seeing some ideas, uh, a lot similar to what I've been using. Uh, one of the tricks they seem to be using uh, is to line up points with uh, objectives. So, uh, you know, you, you have to get, say, 18 out of 20 to get an A. Well, 18 out of 20 is a 90%, so that's an A. Uh, so definitely an interesting idea. Uh, you know, definitely a different take than what I've been using. They've definitely got a lot more kind of full force on that one. Um, I need to think more about that. The workshop continues on for the second half run break. Uh, did the poster session? Uh, oh, boy, Sardine City in there. Uh, one interesting one I saw, there was a poster where they had made a card game. It was a deck builder, so you're drawing and discarding, drawing, discarding, uh, based on instrumentation. So you would have, say, a light source, uh, optical medium, detector, something else. I just forgot what it was. And so you would need to get a sensible instrument with each of the four components. So you'd have to have four cards, and the, I guess the first person in the group that got four cards that would make a, an instrument that made sense <laughs> uh, would win at least that hand. So definitely an interesting idea. Not something I teach, but, or at least not normally, uh, but hey, an idea. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna think more about the workshop. Uh, that'll probably be more in the second uh, or the next clip. So see you in the next clip. Okay, so finished the second half of the workshop and still really trying to process my thoughts on it. Um, if you've read uh, Specs Grading by Nelson, I think it is. I did a video on it, video, link somewhere around here. Um, it's very, very similar, kind of taken from that. Uh, kind of key differences that they were doing, um, first off was, um, you know, spec screening was a part of the course, usually a large part, but definitely not the only thing. A couple of them did do essential learning objectives, which, you know, you have to pass this to pass the course period, and those got unlimited retakes. Some of the other ones were doing four plus uh, attempts for the general objectives. They tend to line things up so they lined up with points. Um, and then we talked about doing it in the lab and that was actually one of their suggestions was actually doing uh, learning objectives and specs grading with the lab setup. So, you know, can you set up this piece of apparatus? Can you find, you know, percent yield, that kind of stuff. Uh, can you actually do lab practical things? And they were doing a lab practicum. 
So that might be an option, not for sure. Um, for going forward, uh, definitely one of those kind of interesting, um, trying to contextualize things. One of the things I did think it was particularly, I don't know if I like or not, was a, some of their strategy was to take their pre-existing assignments, grade them like before, and then bin the grade. So, you know, 80 and above is um, good, um, 60 to 80 is like beginning to get okay, and then less than 60 is just unacceptable. That kind of thing, which to me kind of makes it a lot more work. <laughs> Uh, because, you know, part of the idea of specs grading would be if you do an all or nothing grading or close to all or nothing, you can just boom, 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 grade them. Uh, the other thing that they were doing, which if it would be great if I could do, but I, I personally don't think I could do this, would be doing co-op uh, retakes. So different faculty members would uh, say, OK, this room on Mondays at this time, any one of these like 12 faculty members can retake their exam or retake their uh, specs quiz or whatever they were doing. And then the next, you know, Tuesday, a different faculty member would cover it. And that way you kind of share the, the burden of actually being around for students to take uh, retakes outside of hours. Um, I don't think that would work well for me. Uh, some of them don't really do that. Uh, so they were doing much more in class, which I think is something I'm going to have to do. Uh, yeah, so that was kind of the high point. Uh, trying to think there was one more point of inquiry. It, not doing specs grading just with um, quizzes. So, uh, you know, most of my experience has been with quizzes, this kind of the, the general theme, but instead of doing quizzes, doing, um, you know, seeing it in lab reports, et cetera. So, you know, have, have you mastered writing an intro? Have you mastered citations? That kind of stuff. And then pulling that from other assignments so that they're derived not from their own assignment, from other assignments, and then have abilities to rework or redo those, you know, core specs grading. Also came up in discussion, there's specificians, there is specif... Okay, let me interrupt myself here. A few days ago, me was having issues. Uh, so what I had come in thinking of as specs grading uh, is definitely a thing. And being in higher education and in STEM, that's kind of the, the motif that's taking over. But there are several other similar techniques uh, that I hadn't really been introduced to uh, up until uh, this conference. So kind of for framework, uh, specs grading, the typical approach, the way it's kind of being used in higher ed STEM, which is really where it's taking uh, off at, is about one or two meaningful outcomes per week that are then going to be tested via a quiz. Uh, so it might be something like, you know, students can do dimensional analysis and then they take a quiz that might have three dimensional analysis questions on it and they have to get either all three questions or two of the three questions completely correct. And some places I've seen, you know, like two questions, some places I've seen like ten or, you know, the details vary, but it's usually done with all or nothing um, scoring and usually assessed via quiz. And there's usually around maybe 20 of these per course. Okay, so there are some variants on this. Standards-based grading is the same basic idea, but it's not one or two learning objectives per week for a total of like 20 or something. It's, it's all of the state-mandated learning objectives for K-12. So it would be on the order of, say, 200 learning objectives. Uh, a lot more. Enough that you can't just do quizzes. You know, 200 quizzes in a, a semester or two is just nuts. So you would be looking for these, maybe one quiz the students would uh, be able to check off multiple state standards or on one assignment, and then there would be abilities to redo. So once again, there's this idea of you either make it or you don't, and then you have the abilities to redo. Now, the somewhat more elusive term is known as mastery grading, and this one Everything I can figure out is that there is not an agreed upon definition. There looks to be kind of two camps. One camp is that mastery grading is an umbrella term for specs grading and uh, standards grading, as well as a couple other close cousin approaches. The other camp is that mastery grading is basically specs grading, but a couple of the assumptions don't necessarily hold true. So it may not be all or nothing grading. So you will see some folks doing specs grading 
but using the EMRN grading scale. So uh, exceptional meets expectation, revision needed, and not accessible. So one argument is that's still specs grading. The other argument is that's no longer specs grading because you're not doing all or nothing. Instead, that's mastery grading. And that the next one is if you're not doing quizzes, if you're doing other assignments, then that kind of moves that into mastery grading. Once again, it doesn't appear that there is a definitive definition of all these terms. This is still being kind of worked out. This is still fairly new and something that's been evolving over the last few years, not something that is really crystallized uh, nearly as much. So it depends on what you're doing. Once again, the classic specs grading, as I've kind of talked about the most, is what's taking off in higher education STEM. Uh, there is obviously other things, of course, ungrading, which I didn't talk about in this clip, but is talked about in other clips, uh, are definitely options. Okay, so back to the regular video. Whereas I think the spec grading is going to work a lot better in the college level, just because I don't have time to do 200 quizzes. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the the 20, you know, should work, you know, has worked fairly well for me. And then um, moving things into the lab, that does sound like an interesting option. Uh, taking things like lab notebook pages instead of scoring them normally. Do like the EMRN uh, uh, format. Uh, like I talked about previously, that was in the, the earlier sessions from Sunday. So it might be an interesting idea. Uh, so yeah, see you in later clips uh, going for the second half of today's sessions. Okay, just got done with the evening, uh, or just got done with the Monday evening um, first half of seminar series. Uh, this section was on disruptive grading, at least that's the one I attended. Um, a few ideas from this, this series. One group was doing labs, and uh, this is kind of one of spec grading and, and friends. Uh, but instead of grading each individual lab as lab one, lab two, lab three, each lab was broken into a series of mastery concepts uh, like writing or quantitative analysis, that kind of content. As well as then split off was also things like timely submission. So um, you didn't, you know, you weren't taking off points for turning in late, but the student was still getting penalized. And then, instead of just trying to add up the points, each category, like writing, etc., would be given um, kind of its own grade. So you know, this criteria you to get an A in writing, this criteria to get an A in lab safety, that kind of thing. And each criteria would have its own criteria. Each criteria would have its own requirements to get each grade, and then the grades would be averaged. The second approach was looking at writing and the ability to do kind of resubmissions of writing assignments and using kind of a token-based system. Both systems were actually using a token-based system, uh, kind of participation or other activities with kind of a metacognitive approach. Uh, the second one was basically, you know, here's five, ten writing assignments. You've got a couple of resubmissions uh, with kind of the tokens. Uh, third section, uh, really kind of similar, except this case, instead of doing a bunch of smaller mastery quizzes, they were breaking it into 10 kind of unit tests or module tests, I guess would be more accurate, uh, with kind of a, a mastery grading style. So, you know, to get full credit, you have to get 8 out of 10, you know, to get the next tier down of credit, uh, and so on and so forth. So the student could still miss a little bit. All the questions were graded all or nothing, but the student can miss one or two questions and still get full credit for it. Or if they miss, say, three questions, they'd get, say, 80% credit. Uh, so you've still got kind of that all or nothing, no partial credit, but then it's kind of a fairly easy grade um, for the total number of questions you hit, but you have to hit all the questions perfectly. Third one, or the fourth one was the most extreme. So in this case, uh, they were breaking things into course skills and uh, extension skills. This was module-based, uh, heavily online used. There was still an in-class component, but the in-class was much more support for the online. And so the students would be given multiple choice questions for their core skills. They had to get 95% in order to get it, um, but they could do unlimited retries. So you, know, you either get 19 out of 20 correct or you don't. Retry, retry, retry. Um, once they get that, then they can move on to the extension skills. Students have to get all seven sets of core skills done at once. The extension skills would be graded a more hand grade. This one seems like a lot of work, um, although they were saying that they were able to boil it down. So it sounds like the, you know, the core skills are computer graded. The extension skills 
seem to be some more modest grading requirements. So it sounds like something like a grade scope would be used to help with that. Um, but yeah, so that was this session, and I will see you on the next clip. Okay, so the GoPro's, <laughs> I need to charge the GoPro. Uh, must have left it on. Uh, and so I'm using the other camera with a slightly different lens setup than I normally would, and I know it's kind of crooked. So my apologies. That said, I get the nice bokeh with this camera. Okay, so uh, end of Monday session, so the last four, uh, focus was on ungrading this time. So the, the sessions I've been choosing have been focusing on alternative grading. And so this one has been focusing on ungrading for the last four presenters, where the previous presenters were mostly on spec grading. Uh, okay, so first one was a high school instructor. Um, and they were doing ungrading. Lots of very, very hands-on content, um, which is probably beyond what, as a college instructor, we can do. But, you know, definitely interesting. Uh, they'd be raking them, um, you know, one out of one, which was rare for, hey, you got this, 0.5 out of one, needs revision, and zero to one, it's just you didn't turn it in or it didn't meet. Uh, the catch, though, is here, these numbers didn't actually represent grades. So grades would be discussed by conference um, kind of at the end of the year or periodically. Uh, very hands-on, um, so I'm not for sure you know, how well that would translate into higher ed. Uh, second group was, uh, was a higher ed one. And these guys were doing low level, or, or these folks, I should say, uh, were doing low level uh, introductory classes, even kind of almost pre-introductory. I do apologize for the wind. Okay, so uh, they broke things into a series of modules and each module had, you know, learning objectives. The students were told learning objectives, here's what you need to know. Um, then they would have learning materials. This does seem to have a fairly heavy online component to things. Uh, then they do self-assessments, building a portfolio. So the idea here is they are building a portfolio and then into the years, one-on-one -on -one meetings and basically from this portfolio, justify your grade. Now, this was not, you know, whatever grade you get is what you say it is, you know. So you can say a grade, but you may not get that. Things included, you know, doing the labs were non-negotiable. Um, and then the review questions had, you know, quite a lot, or I should say the self-assessment had quite a lot of metacognitive um, narratives on there. And this was supported by things like questions of the day, uh, checkpoint quizzes, etc. everything else to build a portfolio. So there's a lot of assessments building portfolios uh, leading up to periodic one-on-one -on -one meetings at the end of each module for, you know, 15 minutes to an hour, depending on which semester they were talking about and how many students they have. Uh, this allowed them to do larger projects for the labs, ones that wouldn't necessarily be as easily assessed, um, and then, you know, address other assorted issues. But the whole point here is really they're building that portfolio and they're arguing from the portfolio. So very much what I would be thinking of for the higher level courses, but doing it on an introductory or even almost pre-introductory class. Uh, next speaker was very much the same basic idea. I uh, did a lot of reflection, a lot of metacognitive um, approaches there. Um, but in this case, they also did a lot of you know, student developed policies. So students could, you know, do we want to do in-class quizzes um, on paper or do we want to do them on Alex, et cetera. A lot of the choices were pretty much equivalent and were determined by vote. I would be concerned with doing it by vote um, on getting factions. They had some issues with factions, but yeah, that, that's my concern on that one. Last one, I wouldn't really consider this ungrading, to be honest. This is more of a revision approach. Uh, so multiple choice tests. This, th now this faculty member has like 300 students compared to the others which were in the dozens, uh, maybe high dozens, but still dozens. Uh, I think it was actually 350 for this faculty member. Uh, so they you know, had a lot more students. A lot more, uh, the main thing that was discussed was multiple choice tests. Uh, so you know, a couple points per question and then the students could, didn't have to, but could come in and do uh, meetings, they had to do a reflection kind of on the test itself. So what's your answer and then how well do you feel about this? And then come in and then they could argue, not really argue, but you know, reflect and potentially get half the points back. So you know, if you did a multiple choice question and they mixed up 
greater than versus less than, you know, that might be a reason was like, well, I knew what it was, but I just misread the question kind of thing. Um, the issue with this though is very, very time consuming and some students didn't feel comfortable doing this. Uh, they didn't want to do the one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, and Uh, there was some, the students not focusing on trying to get the grade in the first place, trying to, you know, claw back uh, afterwards. So there was a little bit of an issue there. Uh, so the kind of theme here really was metacognitive reflection. So all of them were really, really focusing on that as opposed to um, kind of, you know, hard checkpoints. If you look at the video I did on this one, that kind of makes sense. The ungrading does fit more with the formative assessment, while specs grading is much more um, summative assessment. Okay, see you in the next uh, portion after the posters. Okay, so fighting with the camera on this one. Don't know why. Um, anyway, so just got back from the poster session. Um, two posters uh, that I thought were particularly interesting. One uh, was basically comparing scores on students who drew, drew out the full mechanisms of uh, biochemical reactions and drawing out the full mechanisms did seem to help. Uh, I do apologize for the wiggling camera. Once again, I no tripod. Um, anyway, second one uh, from my alma mater of all places. I, I actually know the PI, although it's been 20 years since I talked to him. Um, was doing an equilibrium slash Gibbs free energy. So they were going all the way to Gibbs free energy with uh, cobalt and um, uh, chloride. So they would mix uh, cobalt nitrate with um, co uh calcium chloride solid and then do spectrophotometric determination uh, so 470 and I didn't catch the other frequency uh, by comparing those two you could tell which one was doing which kind of thing uh, and get your ratios their frequency equilibriums and from that you can start working out things like Gibbs free energy so definitely sounded interesting and I will um, see you in the next clip which will be Tuesday Okay, so today I just got back from the poster session. Uh, really excited about one of the posters. This was an at-home enzyme kinetics lab using yeast and the lineweaver burke plot for concentration of sugar versus um, amount of CO2 produced was halfway decent. Uh, not perfect, but halfway decent. Uh, so the idea is you take various solutions of sugar water, put them into water bottles, put some yeast in it, put a balloon over it and measure how big the balloon gets. Uh, so really cool idea, something that could be useful for my GOB class and uh, maybe do temperature with this. I don't know, the temperature might be too, too much of a pain um, because this might take a little too long. Before the poster session was the first half of the morning session of seminars. I went to one on argument driven inquiry or claims um, result or claims evidence uh, rationale based inquiry. I pro there'll be a script if I, on how I got that wrong. Uh, but anyways, uh, definitely interesting. It <laughs> kind of not what I was thinking it was going to be. It was much more of kind of like the history and implementation on the large scale. And for me, I kind of need implementation on a small scale, like for my lab, not for the entire university system kind of thing or university. Uh, but I did make some interesting connections, so hopefully getting some resources that I can add into my notes um, after the conference. So that should be uh, quite helpful. Um, yeah, basically the take home is a fair amount of success has been done with the uh, ADI or argument driven inquiry, uh, at least at the schools that have tried it. And there's several schools going for kind of a growth in there. A few resources, there's uh, ADI hub, but that seems to be much more focused K-12 as this does seem to be a slower technique. Uh, so it would require fewer labs, although it has been optimized for um, separately for either K-12 or for uh, higher ed. And so obviously I'd be interested in the higher ed side of it. Uh, it should be interesting. And yeah, I'll see you at the next clip around lunch. Okay, second part of the morning session, uh, continue on with the ADI and um, other um, of the uh, argument-based uh, lab setups. Uh, first lab, uh, really like they were doing an ADI SWH, um, so science writing heuristic for the SWH, um, kind of combined hybrid. And also they really described 
you know, the method they were using for each one of them. I'll try and put a text box somewhere, I don't know where, uh, describing each of their, you know, kind of pure SWH, pure ADI, and then uh, their hybrid, which sounded like a really good idea. I like the hybrid approach. I've always been kind of intrigued by SWH. I never really jumped into it, and so this might make a nice approach. Uh, it really makes me think of, like, the Majors Principles Lab, where, you know, it's a writing course disguised as a lab course. Uh, so I think this would be a great idea. Uh, second one, um, some great lab ideas. Uh, titrating mustard. Didn't realize that yellow mustard has turmeric and that turmeric is an indicator. Should have known all of that, but I didn't. Uh, and so you can just titrate it with like a base and arguably you presumably could do baking soda, you know, dissolved in water and thus at home, very, very friendly or in elementary or middle school classroom, very, very friendly. Some ideas. Uh, third one, uh, was over, um, using um, ADI in a uh, kind of a quarters based system. Um, their, their setup was sufficiently unique. I don't know how much I can take from it, but they did have a really interesting idea of theming their labs. So their first set of labs were themed on Gatorade. <laughs> so like sugar concentration does from the density of the Gatorade, which is very close to something I already do. So that may be being changed real quick. Um, actually I could just do that um, without much change at all. Uh, and then they'd have, you know, dye determination of the Gatorade. I already do that. Um, then they do a bleaching of the dye. And then I think they do like a kinetic someplace else. Well, the kinetics of the bleaching of the dye. So uh, a very interesting approach. Uh, some of which I can do. Some of which kind of crosses different labs. That's why their setup doesn't quite fit with mine. Last one was doing uh, ADI in a physical chemistry setting. Uh, which, of course, <laughs> if I'm teaching PCHEM, something's very, very wrong. Um, but they were doing a kind of an argument-based, kind of a rotational lab system. So, you know, prepare for the lab on Monday, do the lab on, sorry, do the lab on Monday, work up data analysis on Wednesday, redo the lab, because it's, you know, you always get questionable data the first time around, redo the lab on Monday, redo the data analysis, and in the middle have an argument session where students take boards and present uh, to each other, and that sounds like a really great idea. The uh, w one of the previous ones also had talked about kind of using like the table as the board, but the idea is you know use whiteboards, have students rotate through, kind of like a poster session. Uh, so definitely some interesting ideas. Um, so with that said, I'll see you in the next clip. Okay, just got done with the first half of the afternoon session. I uh, did a uh, seminar series on. And I do apologize for construction noises. Did a seminar series on. Um, cultural inclusivity, uh, which would include both cultural aspects, but also disability. First talk was on um, sign language or accommodations to the hearing impaired. Speaking of which, I do apologize for construction noises. Um, TLDR, um, American Sign Language, not English, also lacks a lot of the chemistry words. So the presenter had worked on a project to create chemistry signs. Uh, for ASL, uh, put on ASL Collective, uh, or ASL Corp, <laughs> description floating around somewhere. Anyways, um, and then uh, they found that, because they had a high deaf population at their school, they found that by using the signs um, also with their hearing-abled students, they were able to um, improve mastery, so things like steric hindrance, um, different, and I'm not going to try them, but uh, different like transition methods, uh, signs for those, transition states, I should say, really helped. Uh, next presentation was actually a video. The guy was not able to come. Um, they uh, sent a re video recording, which was on chemistry for visually impaired. Uh, main suggestions were things like um, using raised type, doing braille labels, and that a visually impaired student, um, blind or low vision, I think was the terminology used, uh, is able to do a lot, uh, may need a little bit of help, but we generally think they can't do as much as they really can. Uh, last two were on kind of social, people's belief in themselves in the class and how that affects the class. First was social belonging um, and uh, belonging uncertainty. Uh, basically, the more you feel you belong or the more you feel like you don't belong kind of scenario. Increased belonging uncertainty uh, had negative effects on grades, much more so for women than men, uh, like a lot more so. And even 
per, students' persistence in a class. So take Gen Chem 1 versus Gen Chem 2, whether or not they continue on to Gen Chem 2. Um, even at the same grade level, so it, you would have you know, students who would get you know, a B, and those students which had, for women, for men this did not affect, for women who had um, uh, higher belonging uncertainty were more likely not to continue, even though they got the same grade. The last one was on self-efficacy, basically one's opinion, one's ability. To... I'm going to have to look this one up a little bit more. But the idea of self-efficacy in chemistry, seeing yourself being a chemist kind of thing. The idea uh, was kind of an intervention, doing papers, looking up chemistry jobs, uh, you know, short like half-page ref reflections, um, Nobel Prize winners, um, uh, specifically uh, women and people of color. Um, and how that would affect uh, individuals' view of self-efficacy. And it was a positive effect, especially for women and minority students. Uh, so yeah, so back up for the second half of that, and I will see you uh, after the poster session. Okay, back from the uh, second half of the afternoon um, seminar series, still on the cultural um, inclusivity uh, series. So first presenter uh, had several ideas basically focusing on trying to integrate students' cultural knowledge um, with chemistry. Uh, so presenter was from an HBU and they were doing um, a few projects. The one that stood out the most was they had kind of as a, an end of the lab or kind of, you know, post lab, uh, students linking what they did in the lab uh, to traditional cultural knowledge. So for instance, aspirin synthesis lab, and then backing that with uh, asking them to interview friends and family about alternative pain treatments. Uh, there was a backup in case they couldn't interview folks, but interview uh, friends and family about alternative pain treatments, and then uh, looking up method of action, efficacy, et cetera, of those said treatments. Uh, did a few of those, kind of linking back with cultural knowledge and realizing that just because it's cultural knowledge doesn't mean it's not valid. And so some of those remedies are completely legit. Uh, next presenter uh, was going with utilizing overarching narratives for a series of labs uh, that then tied in with cultural problems. Uh, so they are, once again, an HBU, and they were doing uh, a narrative over diabetes. So it includes not just um, a few lab techniques, but also building up into an understanding of diabetes and the population. Uh, future work or kind of current work, uh, they switched over to lead and drinking water kind of things, which is you know, relevant for their area and to be honest, a lot of the US. Uh, third presenter was looking at, and this was kind of a switch. The first two were kind of lab-based uh, in ways of incorporating labs within a cultural context. The next two were very much undergraduate research base. So using um, traditional, in this case, uh, indigenous knowledge as a source for project ideas for undergraduates. So the idea would be you've got an undergraduate from an indigenous culture. They then ask their friends, family, cultural leaders, etc., cetera, um, about something about general topics. Uh, the one given in this case was this knowledge of uh, caribou migrations uh, with, of course, hunting of caribou. This was very, very northern Alaska. Uh, and then potability of water acquired from melting snow at different depths. So apparently you need to dig deeper into the snowpack to get higher quality water. And they were analyzing chloride concentrations. This led them to go into salinity, chloride concentrations, and thus tying that in together. Uh, actually going and doing field work, although this was right when COVID hit, so some of that was kind of hear one person go out and dig up some snow. And do, once again, potentially publishable research. The other uh, presenter was talking about creating a course-based undergraduate research, or I believe it's called Cure or Curie. Um, and in this case was doing polymers and was leading with a few kind of relevant topics, some of which at that particular uh, faculty member's uh, HBU um, were relevant to a lot of those individuals. They ended up doing um, microencapsulation, which was the general topic. You know, everything was going to be over microencapsulation, microencapsulation uh, because this was a polymer course. 
and the primary choice for most of the students was based on uh, cosmetics for African American hair products. Uh, so they were you know, utilizing that as a culturally relevant to the, that particular student body uh, and allowed the students to pick that. They gave the students a series of choices. The students mostly picked that one. There was a little bit of, uh, you know, a few students chose others. Uh, and then, you know, did a research project kind of showing them techniques. Uh, as they learn about techniques, um, potentially publishable, worthy, although, you know, one semester is not going to lead to a paper kind of thing. It's going to take a little bit more than that. Uh, so they worked on that project, and then the students were proposing projects of their own based on literature reviews that they were uh, doing. So they were originally given, you know, three review articles they had to read, then go look up more review articles and find uh, a project idea. So the students proposed a project. My understanding, the students didn't actually do that project. They were working on the cosmetics project. Uh, but it was still, you know, kind of student-led, students chose, and those were the topics that were of interest to the students. The poster session was heavily focused on adapting COVID adaptations to a future, hopefully, if not post-COVID, but lesser COVID world. So a back to, you know, normal uh, and so taking the at-home labs and turning them back into class labs uh, or, you know, taking the virtual, the things we did virtually and incorporating them back into a face-to-face -face setting. Uh, no particular poster in my mind actually stood out on that. There was a general theme, definitely something we've been all trying to do. Okay, uh, so that kind of wraps up today. I did want to go back to a topic from yesterday that I don't remember how well I actually covered. Uh, on the specs grading, during the workshop, there was one really, I thought, key point that um, what the workshop presenters had found was that with unlimited grade, or unlimited attempts for doing a particular grade, there was incredible diminishing returns after the fourth attempt, so that there was really no reason to have more than four attempts unless it was going to be an essential um, spec grade where the student had to pass that quiz to pass the class, at which point kind of for ethics slash grade appeal reasons, you have to have that unlimited so the students can keep trying so they never have a spot where, well, they have literally no way of passing the course. So kind of a take home on that with specs grading, um, really four repeats, you know, first try, second try, third try, fourth try. There's no reason to do a fifth try for most uh, of that unless you've made it essential. Um, which, to be honest, logistically, four tries is a lot for me. I did two. <laughs> um, I might try and do three. I don't think I can do four. But that said, you know, an interesting topic there. Okay, well, I will see you uh, next time. Okay, I uh, got done with the poster session and the first morning session of the um, uh, GOB um, symposium. So this would be symposium for ideas on general organic biochemistry, a.k.a. the nursing chemistry uh program. Uh, so poster session, I'm going to do it up front because it's a really interesting one. Uh, one poster was on a kinetics lab that uh, used extended release vitamin C tablets. So the classic vitamin C titration, but with extended release tablets. Uh, so interesting idea. Apparently started out as a, oops, we bought the wrong one kind of thing. Um, okay, so the first session, um, a lot on, and I do apologize for the background noise, uh, first session was a lot on kind of like prioritizing topics. So very first speaker uh, was actually someone who teaches um, uh, physician's assistants, uh, you know, had been teaching GOB, but then transitioned to teaching physician's assistants. And it was basically, you know, here are some topics that they mess up, like dimensional analysis a lot. Uh, brought out the recent court case with uh, one nurse who got the wrong medicine. Of course, that's a didn't read carefully enough kind of thing. Turns out there was like a generic versus trade name and that led to some of the confusion, but it was also the third letter was different kind of thing. Um, second one and fourth one both have a couple of citations I really need to look up because you know, those are kind of the core. Uh, basically, which topics are highly important, which topics are important, but maybe not, not nearly so much. So we can kind of do a little bit of triage in our class. Um, and then I think this was the second presenter was talking kind of like how they cover the biochemistry part of GOB, which is you know, my main focus too, because you know, nurses. 
and definitely some topics that I'd already been doing. Um, so it's kind of like the 30,000 foot view of metabolism, you know, glycogen to glucose to pyruvate to Krebs cycle to electron transport, you know, kind of that stuff. Not going for every single enzyme, making sure to get fatty acids, protein synthesis, urea cycle in there, but keeping it at kind of that 30,000 foot view, really looking at the major points, not every single enzyme because that's just as overwhelming. Leave that for the biochemistry course. Um, by the way, there are a ton of ants right now. <laughs> Big black ones. Um, and so, yeah, definitely some interesting topics. Uh, one idea I hadn't thought of is looking at study guides for the nursing boards as a um, idea of where to you know, get inspiration uh, for what to teach, what to maybe cut back on, as well as um, a, a fair number of papers that I, I wasn't aware of. So you've got a you know, fair number of citations. And then, yeah, so I've got some things to do. I've, there are a few things that there are a few topics that I'm going to have to add into my, um, you know, areas, <laughs> you know, into my learning objectives, like um, real gas law. I usually just skip that completely, but it does sound like there's a little bit of that needs to get in there. Um, and then maybe some things like diffusion. Uh, so I need to add that in. And then I'll be working on a flow chart for functional groups, which sounded like a really good idea. Okay, uh, so that's kind of the high points, and I will see you in the next clip after the second morning session. Okay, so um, second half of the morning session is over. Uh, once again, we're still doing the uh, GOB, how was it, uh, Trends in GOB uh, Education, which is the pre-nursing course. Um, first, well, actually, going back to something I didn't mention in the previous clip, or at least I don't think I did. Uh, one of the presenters did a rather interesting presentation on a um, COVID vaccine case study and used that to kind of tie in a lot of themes within the class, uh, such as polarity, uh, pH, etc. Interesting idea. I've never been good at case studies, but I uh, definitely sound like an interesting one. And the idea there was GOB is typically the nursing course, and they were trying to... Um, destigmatize vaccines with nurses, which surprisingly the nursing profession is a little bit vaccine reluctant, a little more so than normal, presumably because they do see the more of the very obscure, very random side effects that, you know, are very rare. But if you, you know, look for people who are sick, they're going to be slightly more common. Okay, uh, second presentation or the second hour, um, there was... Um, kind of two themes going on. One was online education, the other one was belonging. So the first and fourth uh, presenters were both very much on student belonging. Um, the first presenter was doing um, basically Pogel to increase student belonging. So similar as the uh, student belonging and belonging uncertainty from previously. Um, I think there was actually that presenter had worked with the previous one. Uh, so the idea was by doing group work, Pogel is really set up for group work. I mean, it is group work. Uh, and they were with Pogel Project. Um, so, yeah, sounds like a good idea. I use Pogel. I like Pogel. Well, I should say I use guided inquiry learning that I produce in the Pogel style. Uh, trademarks, yay. Uh, the fourth presenter um, was talking about kind of engaging with uh, students and setting out uh, schedules for studying, especially for asynchronous online students and kind of, you know, okay, here are the things you need to be doing to be successful. And, you know, you, if not creating a draft schedule for them, just kind of keeping in mind how much time they need to be spending on different items uh, within the course kind of thing. And then being mindful you don't accidentally assign too much and not being too restrictive on due dates, but, not letting them fall too far behind. Um, so yeah, fairly straightforward. A lot of things that hopefully, you know, you get used to and you, you kind of discover over time. Uh, that presenter was actually recently retired. Uh, so they're kind of at the emeritus status. This was kind of a, an, an elder, you know, experience presenter. Second presenter was comparing student learning outcomes for their online class in 2020, 2020, 2021 and their in person, they had some incidences like a COVID outbreak and a water main break uh, during 21-22. 
uh, they did the same tests, all online tests, because you know we're still kind of in that really transitional period. Uh, and they were comparing how students did. And what they found was the withdrawal rate during the online uh, time frame was much higher. They also found that, at least for the earlier learning objectives, the ones that occurred earlier in the class, the in-person the, the next year performed much better. Whereas uh, there was some benefit for the online course in the later learning objectives, but the questions are either the nature of the learning objectives or is this is the fact when like a third of the students had dropped. So there was a massive kind of withdrawal or a massive retention issue for the online course. Of course, this was all 2020. This was pandemic. So this is not necessarily online versus in person, although it kind of is. And these were fairly small sample sizes. So the, the presenter was very, very upfront. I hope this wind is not getting picked up too much by the mic. I do apologize. Uh, the presenter was very much upfront with, you know, this is not statistically significant necessarily sample sizes through the floor. The third presenter um, had an interesting project. They had worked on creating several modules um, for combining chemistry and biology. So it was a, a chemist and biologist team, which was interesting having a biologist in the room. Um, they, they must have felt a little bit alone, but hopefully not too much. Um, but they were presenting this kind of combined, here is the biology, here's the chemistry, here's, how, here's why you need to know this chemistry, and linking that straight into the biology. So they had created this kind of online um, multi-modality uh, approach. So you could do either online asynchronous, online synchronous, hybrid, or uh, once again, I hope that one's not too bad, or face-to-face. -face. They were kind of working on that one. And so there was a series of modules uh, that would allow you to integrate both the biology and the chemistry uh, together, which sounds like an interesting idea. Something I probably want to poke a little bit more on and kind of highlight that, um, just because you know I am a biochemist, I'm cross-trained, and that for our students would be quite relevant. Uh, so yeah, that was kind of the 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 second half. Uh, I guess next up, I'm going to a workshop on Kim Lieber text, so this should be interesting. I will see you in the next video. Okay, so I just finished the Libra text workshop and just, wow. Um, yeah, that was a lot. Okay, so they've got multiple products kind of working together. Um, it was normally a three-day workshop condensed into three hours, and yeah, it was a lot. Okay, uh, so book-wise, presumably you're already familiar with Libra text, so different open educational resource or OER uh, books. They've got maps, which are basically taking open educational resources, reshuffling them to mimic um, a copyrighted book. So say Brown and LeMay, obviously that's copyrighted, so you can't just download Brown and LeMay, at least you're not allowed to, but there is equivalent resources that uh, LibreText has created, and they've arranged it in a way that is equivalent order because you're not allowed to copyright pedagogies you're not allowed to copyright table of contents but you can copyright you know the actual text so it's new text but covers the same content or the same pedagogy you know not necessarily a perfect one-for-one -one match but it's going to be relatively close so if you used Brian LeMay you could then use the map of Brian LeMay well if you get an instructor account with LibreText you can remix and create your own map to fit whatever pattern you'd like. So you can take OER resources within LibreText library and create your own map with those uh, called remixing. And then you can even edit those. So you've got a lot of options. Um, once again, my head literally hurts thinking about all the options you have. Um, next up on the interesting bit, there is, I have to look this one up. Adapt. It's part of their Libreverse as they're going with. Um, it's an online homework platform. As far as online homework platforms go, comparing it to Sapling, I'd say it's probably a bit less polished than Sapling. Um, it's definitely intended for you to go, in many respects, make your own questions. Um, but there's definitely a lot of questions out there. It's kind of the online homework platform 
for OpenStax or an online homework platform for OpenStax is based heavily around the OpenStax books. But you can add your own questions. They've got a couple different languages you can do that. H5P, um, a, a native which is mimicking uh, the LMS language, or it is the LMS language for most LMSs, they use the same language, apparently. Uh, two more that, why don't I just look them up? <laughs> uh, iMathAS and WebWork. Once again, this is all new to me. Um, and so you can write your own questions. Uh, students can then access, adapt either via the web. You can link it in with your uh, remixed uh, Libra text, uh, link to your I, uh, through your LMS, or you know, eventually they're going to have an app. Near future, apparently a lot is changing. They recently got a big grant. Uh, big grant. Okay, so yeah, there's a dozen um, homework suites out there. This one's kind of middle of the road. Honestly, I would say lower middle of the road is probably great for the students. Once you get it set up, but the work on setting it up is for the faculty is going to be high. The catch with this, or the, 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 the twist, is that the cost per student is literally zero. Um, yeah, um, free online homework system, full, I mean, it's full functioning. Um, you've got the grade book, you've got LMS support, Potentially, obviously, your LMS folks have to get the APIs hooked in, etc. Gradebook looks to be fairly well advanced. It can actually do some of the jobs of an LMS, like you can have other grades into it. So, yeah, um, for the price of free, it's beyond exceptional. Um, Workload-wise, I don't know if I'm going to switch. Uh, but then again, it gives me options, so it's definitely very, very tempting. And if you're looking for low textbook cost, can't get lower than free. So, you know, free textbook with Kim Libra. Uh, caveat, if you are remixing it, um, th each university gets uh, five remixes. So you, if you're the only person doing this in your, your university, then you can do five books. If there's five faculty, they can each do one book. Uh, after that, there is a $1,000, I think, per year fee for the university. Comparatively speaking, that's very low for, you know, university-wide site license. Obviously, for one faculty member, that's a lot. So, yeah, um, other resources on that one. Um, LibreText has their own YouTube page. They've got a bunch of tutorials there. I'm probably going to have to go back through all the tutorials. Um, because once again, this was drinking from a fire hose. This was like fire boat <laughs> level. This is beyond fire hose uh, for content. But yeah, definitely an interesting option. I, you know, I've been familiar with Libra for a while, and yeah, they, they're kicking it up a notch, and they're supposed to be really expanding here in the near future. Okay, so with that said, um, this wraps up uh, Wednesday, and so next clip should probably be Thursday and the conference is nearly over. Well, see you in the next clip. Okay, so I'm hoping the weird noise doesn't come through on this clip, but I'm guessing it will. So uh, Thursday morning, I decided to go to a session on teaching writing, uh, which, you know, it's kind of a big deal. <laughs> um, so first session of the morning, uh, obviously the second one's still coming up. Uh, of the four presenters, two of them canceled. So the first two, we didn't have presentation, so we just kind of sat around chatting um random stuff but a couple thoughts on writing were discussed uh a few folks were using um the same one i've tried where it's like here's a primary research paper let's look at it here's a review article let's look at it here's a meta review article let's look at it. okay let's discuss these things uh so that seemed to be kind of a common trend uh, another one in the category of i feel like an idiot why didn't i not think of this before was when telling students to research a topic, and this guy was doing a cure or course undergraduate research, sorry, noise, um, that he would, instead of giving them the topic, which I think was like bioplastics of a certain type, he would actually give them keywords. So the students would need to look up, you know, papers. They were doing SciFinder Scholar, presumably you could use the same with Google Scholar. Um, uh, with these keys words in it and then within kind of these time frames and 
well, frankly, you know, getting the right keywords is the hard part of a scientific literature search. And then the other idea was the students would be probably picking articles to read and look at that were relatively close to their personal interests. So pre-med students would probably be looking up more medical base. Physics students would probably be looking at more material science based, that kind of stuff. So it sounds like a really cool idea. The, <laughs> the third presenter, who was the first to actually be there, uh, was doing Pogol and writing. So the idea is instead of using a model for your Pogol activity, you use a scientific paper. Uh, you may not use the whole paper, but use a lot of it. I uh, mean, points if you're doing this, you need a short, at least the first time you do this, you need a short, really good paper. Um, late, the second and third time, you're a little bit less restricted on how, how good a paper it is. And you build this once again as a Pogol model. And they actually use this to teach a topic. It's not just on reading papers, but it would be also on, say, enzyme kinetics and inhibition or something. So pairing a paper to that. This was a biochemist. The second to present, the fourth on the queue, uh, was doing a program where they're focusing on writing. So I should say this, this workshop or this uh, seminar series on write, reading and writing papers. And there is a robot. Okay. Um, yeah, I had to do that. <laughs> so the second presenter that presented, uh, they were doing a, a series where they were doing kind of um, write part of a, you know, do a lab, write part of a paper. And this was in a PCHEM class, so seniors. Uh, write part of a paper, do as a rough draft, do a workshop on that part, then go to peer review and then do review you know, final uh, product and set up a series of workshops, two on uh, discussion, so discussion, argument structure, discussion, storytelling, uh, as well as including things like language, you know, active voice, um, ditching uh, prepositions, etc. And then they did one on, let's see if I can remember, it wasn't the introduction, that was last Oh, it was on results. So it was discussion, discussion, results, intro. They kind of skipped materials and methods, uh, which they were trying to clam in a lot in a one credit hour PCAM lab. So I totally understand why they skipped MMM. Um, but yeah, so it's definitely interesting. So heading up to the second part after the break, uh, no poster sessions today. Also, there's a lot less people uh, here today than there was um, the last couple of days. Thursday is the day that a lot of people, if they need to get an early flight, they, they get the early flight and skip Thursday. Uh, but I've definitely enjoyed the first, this uh, last seminar. See what happens on the next one. So see you in the next clip. Okay, so final reception in the uh, car in the parking lot of local Myers before I get on the interstate to head home. Um, last part of the session, uh, once again, another speaker canceled. Kind of the end of the conference. This is not uncommon. Although disappointing, a couple of speakers that canceled I wanted to hear. Um, the first speaker in the second half uh, was very much a continuation of the um, last speaker of the first half. So they had done a workshop, but in this case for their general chemistry students. Uh, so the students were given sample data uh, or sample information, so they didn't have to come with their own experimental data. So it was kind of separate, and they're actually going to more formally separate these two areas. But they're given sample information. They'd have to write a part of a report, not the whole thing, maybe an abstract or results or something. And then they'd do a workshop, and the workshops were kind of video-based because they've got TAs, a little bit more complicated series. So they made a series of YouTube videos on how to write. Uh, then they would pause the video or stop that video, get ready for the next one, do a class discussion about what they learned about writing, uh, repeat a couple of times over a 25-minute you know, period. Then the students would revise, do a peer review, and then turn in um, a final product based on the sample data they were given. Okay, um, second speaker was the one that dropped. Third, <laughs> third on the schedule, second in, in actuality. They were doing um, a lab course that was kind of a, a cure or a, whatever the, that thing's called, uh, undergraduate research as a course. Uh, this was organic lab. So in that case, they had like a 10-week project. And they started out with kind of like, okay, write a bunch of parts of a paper and then smush them together. It didn't work well. So like, okay, 
So this particular class, there's really no results in discussions. Basically, I made the thing or I didn't. So that style, the, if they were to write a scientific paper, which of course is hopefully in the future, that would actually get published, then that paper's style or the journals that they would put it in would basically be ones that had maybe three pages worth of intro and a paragraph or half page worth of results in discussion. Uh, so there's a lot more setup for that style. So like, you know, we're just going to work on the introduction and the abstract as well as figures. And once again, with that branch of organic chemistry is very, very figure heavy. And, you know, a lot of reading the papers really looking at the pictures, which let's just be honest, that's fairly common. So what they did uh, was a couple of things. One, they actually reformatted a paper so that it was basically abstract and then pictures and references. So kind of like what you really look at first when you look at a paper before you go back and reread it and in depth uh, to kind of show the students like, no, this is how you actually read them. <laughs> you, you, you read the abstract. The first line is like key. You're not going to spend two minutes reading a paper. You're either going to spend 30 seconds or you're going to spend a couple of hours. Um, 30 seconds, read the first line or two of the abstract, maybe the whole abstract, look a couple of pictures and say, nah, not for me. Or a few hours where you really dive deep into it. Uh, the second thing, they were doing a multiple iterations. This kind of reminds me of Extra Credit's Fail Faster poster, which I have on my wall, uh, which is basically iterate, iterate, iterate over and over again as early as you can. So don't do a bunch of work and then do one final review. Do a little work and then get it reviewed, have, you know, test it out, see what's working, and then revise, 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 revise. And that was kind of goal here. The uh, last presentation uh, was on setting up a journal club um, and then kind of writing. Um, and I may have transposed that reformatting a paper from one to the other. So that may have actually been the last one. Uh, but the last one definitely did was used, and I'll have the link down here. I can't remember the name of the uh, authors, but used kind of a template to say, okay, you need to read a paper that's going to go into your thesis. So here's a review template. So answer these questions as you're going through the paper. Uh, they were also using a nonfiction writing book, not a chemistry writing book, and doing exercises from that to help the students actually write in a more broad spectrum. Now, some of the exercises they kept wholesale, like argue whether or not a hot dog is a sandwich. You know, that's argumentation. A scientific paper is really an argument paper. Um, you're arguing that you, your idea is legit or that your interpretation of your data is good and that anyone should care about it. Um, but they also change things like, you know, describe how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich that replaces to describe how to do an experiment, you know, whatever particular experiment. Uh, and of course that's the materials and methods section of a paper. So definitely some interesting uses. I'll try and get a bunch of links down there. Uh, this, this video is going to take forever to edit, uh, but I'm going to try to get those in the descriptions uh, for a lot of stuff that's been covered. And I'll probably do one final reflections uh, once I'm back home. Uh, so until then, um, I'm going to head into the grocery store and head home. I will see you uh, in the final clip of the video. Okay, now that I'm back, uh, taking a little bit of time to reflect on the conference as a whole. Um, I definitely am going to be rooting through my notes uh, and making some changes. I've got, you know, several um, learning objectives to start tweaking and adding in uh, for a couple of my classes, a couple of labs I want to try or demos I want to try. So uh, a lot going on and then looking kind of at the argument driven inquiry, which I didn't get too much into during the conference, but made some connections. So I want to kind of research more into that. Turns out there was a workshop I could have done. Uh, I just didn't see it. So I was like, uh, oh, well, um, but yeah. So hope the video has been informative. Hope I've given you a few things to think about. And uh, with that said, have a wonderful day and I will see you in probably more traditionally produced videos.